Man After Man, An Anthropology of the Future, written by Dougal Dixon, with illustrations by Philip Hood. Introduction, Evolution and Man. Evolution is the process that brought us to where we are today. It started about 3,500 million years ago, when the first living thing, probably a single, complex organic molecule in the form of a long chain, began to reproduce itself. It did this by latching onto simpler molecules dissolved in the water around it until it built up a mirror image of itself. The two parts then split apart to become two identical complex molecules. Each of these had the same power of attracting simpler molecules and building up a mirror image similar to the way in which viruses reproduce themselves. The building up and the splitting took place untold millions of times. Inevitably, on occasion, the mirror image so produced was not accurate. As a result, the new molecule had slightly different properties from the old, and may not have been so efficient at reproducing itself. In this case, the changed molecule, the mutation, stopped reproducing and died out. However, the occasional mutation arose that actually helped the molecule to reproduce itself. The mirror images, the offspring, of this mutation then survived. This is the basis of the process that we call evolution. After millions of beneficial chance mutations, the single molecule became more and more complex, if complexity ensured a more efficient reproductive process. The molecule changed from a virus-like entity to a living cell, in which the reproductive molecule or molecules were encased and protected by an outer membrane. This resembled one of our modern bacteria. The chemical reactions that enabled early molecules to reproduce themselves may have been insufficient to power the reproduction of more advanced creatures, and other energy sources developed that allowed the absorption of energy from sunlight, and the use of this energy to build up raw materials for reproduction. The first single-celled plants had evolved. Other mutated cells did not use the sun's energy. Instead, they digested the cells that did, and so used the energy already stored. These were the first animals. Eventually, creatures evolved that consisted of more than just a single cell. This came about either by cells reproducing themselves and then failing to split, or by several cells coming together. Whichever it was, if the multi-celled creature were more efficient, then it survived and reproduced in its multicellular form. With the increasing complexity, the different cells in a single creature evolved to have different functions. Some cells were involved in scents, helping the creature to find food or light. Other cells were involved in locomotion, in moving the whole creature towards its food or its light source. Others were involved in digestion, others in reproduction, and so on. The different masses of cells are what we call tissues, and the structures that they form, each with a different function, are called organs. An entire creature, made up from molecules that make cells, that make tissues, that make organs, is called an organism. At an early stage, the pathways of evolution began to branch, and different types of organism developed. Wherever there was a food source that could be exploited, evolution produced an organism able to exploit it. Such a process is called adaptive radiation, and we can see it at work today. Many species of finch live in the Galapagos Islands, off the west coast of South America. These all evolved from one type of seed-eating ground finch that came over from the mainland, and spread to all the islands, each with different habitats and food sources. The finches on each island evolved to take advantage of their particular habitat. As a result, there are now many species of finch on the islands, including heavy-beaked forms that eat seeds, short-beaked forms that eat buds and fruit, and long-beaked forms that eat insects. Environments are not stable, they change for one reason or another. When this happens, a creature evolved to live in a particular way in a certain environment becomes extinct. For example, if all the insects on the Galapagos Islands died out, then the long-beaked finches would become extinct, a process known as natural selection. 
If the insects became extinct, their places would be taken by another creature, and some other bird would evolve to eat that. Evolution produces specific shapes of animals to live in particular environments. Grass is tough to eat, so an animal that eats grass needs strong teeth and a specialised digestive system. Grasslands are wide open areas in which danger can be seen coming from a long way away, and there are no hiding places. A grass-eating animal, therefore, tends to have long running legs, as well as strong teeth and a long face so that its eyes are above the level of the grass while its head is down eating. This gives us the shape of the antelope, the typical grass-eating animal of Africa. However, the grasslands of Australia have evolved a quite unrelated grass-eating animal, the kangaroo. There seems little resemblance between this and the antelope of Africa. It does, however, have the same long face with similar grass-grinding teeth, and the legs are long and built for speed, albeit in a bounding rather than running gait. This development of similar features in unrelated animals in response to similar environmental conditions is what is known as convergent evolution. It accounts for the similarities between seals and sea lions, aardvarks and anteaters, ants and termites, vultures and condors. A similar phenomenon is parallel evolution. In this, two branches of the same family tree develop along similar lines independently of one another. For example, the kit fox of North America and the fennec fox of Africa are both small with a sandy pelt and large ears. The ears act as cooling veins and prevent each animal overheating in its desert environment, and the pelt is camouflage. Both are descended from a more conventional fox-like animal, but each has evolved separately to live in different deserts. The different colours and patterns in animals can also be attributed to evolutionary processes. Animal patterns may camouflage them. On the other hand, they may, like the skunk, have striking colours that warn a would-be attacker that the owner is poisonous. Some animals mimic others, as when a harmless king snake develops the spectacular pattern of the poisonous coral snake, and consequently turns away potential enemies. All of these have developed because the animals concerned have benefited from them, have survived and have gone on to reproduce. Throughout the world and throughout time, animals and plants have changed in response to the changes in the environment. One species has broken with this tradition. Within the last million years or so, the human species Homo sapiens evolved. It has come all the way from molecules to its present form in 3500 million years by the workings of evolution. Now, within the last few millennia, intelligence has developed, and with it cultures and civilizations. The species has spread not by changing to adapt to the environments it found, but by changing the environments to suit itself. Instead of developing furry pelts and layers of insulating fat to adapt to cold conditions, it manufactures artificial coverings and uses available energy supplies to generate heat for the body. Instead of evolving heat-radiating structures such as big ears to adapt to hot conditions, it manufactures refrigeration and air conditioning systems, again using available energy supplies. Instead of developing speed and killing strategies that allow it to hunt a particular food, it builds machines to do it. By using its intelligence, it can exploit all food supplies in all environments without having to change itself. Medical science eliminates much of the effects of natural selection. No longer does an individual not particularly well adapted to the environment die out before being able to reproduce. Under natural conditions, not all offspring of a species survive, and this is reflected in the birth rate. Thanks to medical science, more offspring of Homo sapiens survive than ever could have before, but this has not been reflected in a corresponding drop in the birth rate. As a result, the populations of Homo sapiens are growing without the refining and modifying processes of natural selection. Evolution as we know it for Homo sapiens has stopped. However, this does not mean that the process of change has necessarily stopped. As science develops, the reproductive molecules, the genes, that exist within every cell of the human body are becoming better and better understood. 
When Homo sapiens finally appreciates which parts control the development of which features, then the possibility exists for modifying the process. A stage will be reached when one gene can be suppressed, another encouraged, with yet another created from new. A human being with particular features, following a particular preconceived plan, may be born from modified sperm cells and over. Without the natural processes of modification, this unnatural process is the only way of developing the species into new forms to face the problems that await it in the future, problems generated by overpopulation, overuse of natural resources, and pollution. Genetic Engineering The mechanics of genetic engineering are already complex, yet in their current state they are primitive compared to what will undoubtedly be possible within a few decades. The reproductive molecules that lie at the nucleus of each cell of a living organism are in the form of long structures called chromosomes. These chromosomes are made up of the chemical substance DNA. Its shape is best imagined as a long ladder that has been twisted along its length. Each rung of this ladder consists of two compounds, called bases, locked together. There are only four different kinds of bases, thymine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine, referred to as T, C, A, S, and G. A T always unites with an A, and a C always with a G. The sequence of these base pairs along the twisted ladder of the chromosome is almost infinitely variable. There are something like six billion bases in a full set of human chromosomes. A chromosome is often described as a page in an instruction manual. Each base pair, or rung in the ladder, represents a letter of the alphabet, and the arrangement along the ladder gives words and sentences. Each understandable instruction so formed gives a gene. The genes in a single cell produce the total information needed for the growth of the entire organism. When an organism grows and develops, it does so by multiplication of cells. Each cell splits into two complete cells. When this happens, each chromosome in the cell actually splits down the middle. The uprights of the twisted ladder pull away from one another, as the rungs split into two along the joins between the bases. What happens then is that these two half-ladders build up two complete ladders by attracting free bases made up from the chemicals drifting in the cell. As a result, when the cell splits into two, each new cell carries exactly the same set of gene instructions. The exception to this process is in sexual reproduction. Reproductive cells carry half the normal number of chromosomes. Two half-cells unite during fertilization to produce one cell with a full number. This new cell is a unique mix of genes, half from the mother and half from the father. This cell then divides in the usual manner until the entire organism is built up, following the instructions now carried in every cell. The big mystery now is this. How do the genes, the pattern of base pairs along a chromosome, actually work? How do they control the construction of an organism? The idea behind genetic engineering is to manipulate natural processes. In some way, genetic instructions along the chromosomes in a cell have to be identified, then changed, so that as the organism grows, it is to a new set of instructions. Since all the materials involved, cells, chromosomes, molecules, are microscopic, a whole new technology has to be applied. Viruses can do it. Viruses essentially consist of a mass of their own DNA encased in an envelope. When they infect a cell, they attach themselves to the cell's wall and inject their DNA through it. In the cell's interior, the invading DNA breaks down the cell's chromosomes and rebuilds the material into copies of itself. For genetic engineers to do the same, they would first of all have to break in through the cell wall, then break down the DNA of the nucleus and reassemble it in the desired way. Alternatively, they could cut out segments of the DNA strand, segments that correspond to particular genes, and replace them with DNA segments already prepared. This would be done by chemicals that have specific biochemical reactions, enzymes, some of which have been found to have the ability to cut DNA strands. The greatest experimental successes so far have been with bacteria. 
These single-celled creatures have cell walls that can be softened by chemical solutions so that new DNA can be placed inside. The double helix of the original chromosome can be chopped up using enzymes, and new DNA can be inserted. The broken ends of the DNA strands have one side longer than the other, exposing a sequence of bases. If the introduced DNA segment has matching bases exposed at its end, the two DNA pieces will unite, T to A and C to G, and produce a complete chromosome. This technique is known as gene splicing. Before any of this can be attempted, however, the whole gene pattern has to be mapped. At the moment, only about 100 human genes have been identified and interpreted, but since genetics has only been in existence for a century, and the structure of the chromosome has only been known for about four decades, and scientific advance in this area is increasing exponentially, what was speculation about genetic engineering is quickly becoming fact. Part 1. In the Beginning. The Human Story So Far. Eight million years ago. Her ancestors lived in the treetops that once covered the area. Indeed, her relatives still live in the forests of the steamy lowlands, climbing the branches, eating the soft fruits and grubs. Her way of life is, however, completely different. Hers is a dry landscape of yellow grass, with brown and black thickets of hardy thorn trees. Her woodland diet is different, too, because there are no soft fruits and juicy buds or grubs here. Solid nuts and tough seeds are her main foodstuffs, and when there is nothing else, she makes do with coarse roots and tubers. Hard-shelled insects and dry lizards abound, and she often extracts what little nutrition there is from these. Her jaws and teeth reflect the fact that she has to eat more than her ancestors did to gain the same amount of goodness, and she has to chew it more thoroughly. Accordingly, her front teeth have become smaller to make room for broad and flat back teeth that grind down masses of coarse food. This has not happened suddenly, but has developed over thousands and thousands of years. Those who study her remains will give her a name. They will call her Ramapithecus. The other animals that live here show the same specialisations in their teeth. Pigs and antelope feed on low-lying plants, and giraffes browse the higher trees. These two have broad back teeth, but she has a long way to go before she is as well adapted as they are. For one thing, the grasses are very tall, and when she is on the ground she is lost, and cannot peer over them. There are fierce hunting beasts around too, so she needs to climb the trees for safety as well as to see distances. The other animals run away when threatened, but she does not have the speed, running on all fours on short limbs. Stiffly, she pushes herself to her hind feet and sways unsteadily for a time. Now she can see over the top of the grass, and, what's more, she feels cooler. Less of her back is exposed to the hot sun, and the cool breeze that she now feels soothes her neck and chest. Overheating was not a problem in forest shade. The more comfortable temperature, however, is counteracted by discomfort in her legs, as this is not a natural pose for her. Maybe she can move more quickly like this, with only two feet touching the ground. She tries, but her legs are not strong enough, and are the wrong shape for this to work. Her body naturally topples forwards, and she cannot move her hind legs quickly enough to stay upright. She descends once more onto all fours. No, she will have to stay near the trees if she wants to survive. Three million years ago. The climate is much drier now, and the scenery has changed considerably. The continent has been moving, gradually splitting the landscape across with faults, while elongated slabs have slowly subsided, forming long, deep rift valleys, with strings of shallow lakes in their floors. Molten material has been brought up from the Earth's interior, and active volcanoes line the edges of the rift. Grasslands have spread everywhere, and there are many clumps of trees, but no continuous forest. At the edge of one such clump, a small creature drops from a tree to the ground, and then stands upright. He looks around for danger, and, seeing none, grunts a signal. The dozen others who drop from the branches and cluster around him include other males, much smaller females, some with babies, and children. It is a large family group. 
food has become sparse in their thicket, and they are moving. Further down the valley, a patch of green by a lake holds out some hope. With a confident stride, they march downhill, leaving footprints in the volcanic ash that carpets the whole area from the last eruption. Their stride and stance show that their legs have developed considerably in the last five million years. From permanently bowed structures only good for climbing trees, their legs have developed into straight limbs that can carry their bodies vertically. Their arms, however, have changed little during that time. They still have the curved fingers for grasping branches, and the shoulder socket angled upwards allowing a high reach, both features of a tree-living way of life. If the landscape becomes much drier though, and the trees more sparse, beings that are better adapted for a ground-dwelling existence will be more likely to survive than this partially tree-living creature, Australopithecus afarensis. That time is not far off. 2.5 million years ago. Volcanoes still bubble, grassy plains still spread along the rift valleys, but now only isolated umbrella-shaped trees and low thorn thickets break up the yellow of the landscape. Down by the edge of the lake, a pack of large hyenas has brought down an animal that looks like a short-necked giraffe with moose-like horns and are tearing its corpse apart. In one mass of bushes, a number of heavy-looking beasts forage amongst the thorny vegetation for leaves and berries. If it were not for their upright stance, they would be mistaken for chimpanzees, as they have the same heavy bodies and the same deep jaws with massive teeth. These also belong to a species of Australopithecus, called Australopithecus robustus, and they are perfectly at home here as they contentedly chew any piece of vegetable material they find. Suddenly, the nearby grass erupts. About a dozen screeching figures run at the feeders. They look much like the others, but are more lightly built, and their faces do not have such a heavy-jawed look. They belong to another species, A. africanus. The feeders stop eating and snarl back, staring defensively at the newcomers and showing their teeth and gums. They are not to be chased away from their feeding ground. The attackers halt in their assault, their intended victims seem more determined than they had anticipated. The attackers back away slowly, keeping up their aggressive noises and trying not to appear vulnerable, then regroup some distance away. The berries of the thicket are lost to them. They turn their attention to the hyenas feeding down by the lake and, as a group, charge them. The hyenas are startled by this sudden assault, and in a panic they abandon their kill. The attackers gather around the corpse, some of them tearing at the meat while others stand guard, waving sticks and snarling at the cheated hyenas. These creatures can eat meat as well as plants, and can combine forces in order to procure it. Their larger relatives, in the thicket, continue munching their berries. Meat-eating and cooperative hunting is not for them. 1.5 million years ago. It seems the same place, for the landscape has changed very little, though the climate is now much cooler. Large chimpanzee-like creatures still forage for berries amongst the bushes. These creatures, however, are larger than the earlier berry eaters, and have very heavy jawbones. Later anthropologists gave them various names, such as Zinjatheropus, Nutcracker Man, before deciding that they were members of the earlier A. Robustus. Not far away, several very much smaller ape-like beasts, evolved from the earlier A. africanus, carry a dead antelope between them. That is not all they carry. They have stones that have been chipped into edges, points and blades, for these creatures are tool makers, and as such they have a culture, later referred to as the Paleolithic, or Old Stone Age. Their scientific name reflects this tool-making skill, it is Homo habilis, meaning handyman. The two groups pass very close to one another, but totally ignore each other's presence. Now they have evolved in such diverse directions, they no longer compete for the same food. 500,000 years ago. She is a member of the first group of humanoid creatures to move out of Africa and spread across Europe and Asia. She crouches in the cave entrance in what will be known as China, but far away, in places that will be called Spain, Java, and Tanzania, there are beings just like her. 
If she stood up, she would be seen to be very similar to a 20th century human, but with a heavier jaw, protruding eyebrows, and a flat forehead. Her upright stance gives her species the name Homo erectus. As she watches the hunters drag home the slain bison, while other females carry back their handfuls of hackberries and pine kernels, her thoughts are only on the food that they bring, and how this food is to be prepared. Cooperation with others and skills learned from her parents provide her with food. With a stick, she stirs the powdery whiteness in the fire pit before her, uncovering the deep red glow. She adds dry twigs to bring the glowing embers to life. She cannot remember when or how the fire started, but hers is the responsibility for keeping it going. It is a heavy responsibility, too, since fire makes the meat tender enough to eat easily, its smoke preserves what meat they do not eat immediately, and its frightening light keeps away the fierce night animals. She knows that it is her responsibility because the group of 23 who occupy the cave have talked it over. Not in words, but in significant sounds that mean something to those in the group, a long stride on the road to civilization. 15,000 years ago. A horse develops before him. Red soil from one part of his stone dish has been applied with a pad of moss to the cave wall, to block in the basic shape. Now he takes soot and smears it along the figure's back, pointing up its ears. The same black pigment goes into making the legs and the hooves. In the confined space and by the flickering light of his flame, it is difficult for him to stand back and appreciate his work. He knows, however, that he has done it to the best of his ability, and this gives him deep satisfaction. Squeezing through the narrow limestone passage towards the cave mouth, he passes other paintings. Bulls, reindeer, bison and rhinoceros have been depicted there since long before his time. He blows out his flame and stands, dazzled, on a limestone shelf, looking down the hill at the wooded gorge below. Smoke rising against the far cliff shows where his people live, sheltered against the coming winter blast beneath the overhang. He belongs to the species Homo sapiens, subspecies sapiens, and there are probably no more than 10,000 like him in the area that will one day be known as Central France. Further to the north, on the tundra plains of Germany, his cousins Homo sapiens neanderthalensis are now extinct, either wiped out in the latest surge of the Ice Age, or else so interbred with the more successful Homo sapiens sapiens that their characteristics have disappeared in their offspring. It is Homo sapiens sapiens, or Cro-Magnon man, with his artistry and his advanced Paleolithic culture, who will be the ancestor of mankind to come. 5,000 years ago. The river valley has always produced the best plants, and since most food comes from one plant or another, the river valleys of northern Europe are well settled. With the knowledge that plants grow from seed, the people of the settlement have gathered seed and planted it in the fertile valley soil. When the plants are ripe, they are cut down with stone-bladed sickles, and the seeds ground down to flour by rolling them between coarse stones. What can be done for plants can also be done for animals. On the cold plains to the north, people still follow migrating herds of reindeer, so that meat is always available but the settlers can do better than this. Their animals, their cattle, sheep, goats and pigs, are kept penned near the settlements so that meat, wool and milk are constantly accessible. As a result, for the first time in history, substantial houses can be built on frames of tree trunks hewn by the stone implements, walled by dried clay and sticks. Straw, left over from the grain harvest, goes into making the roof. Now there is also time and opportunity for pottery and horn ornaments to be crafted. It is the era known as Neolithic, or New Stone Age. The cultivation of plants and the domestication of animals have both heralded this new culture. It will not be long now before the settlers, with their more stable lifestyle and the time to apply their minds to abstract problems, learn to smelt and use metals, first bronze and then iron, and this knowledge will spread throughout most of the populated world. 2,000 years ago, Lucius Septimus chews his twice-cooked bread at the entrance of his hide tent, having cleaned his iron weaponry and his armour. 
Out there, in the rain, the grey choppy sea that beats against the northern limit of Gaul is an uninviting sight. The wild Britons of the lands to the north have been a thorough nuisance, giving constant aid to rebellious Gauls and holding up the establishment of Roman civilization in these northern lands. Also, it is said that there is great mineral wealth to be had there. Stories abound of wealthy metal merchants making their fortunes by plying these dangerous waters. Certainly, the military victory achieved here by the late Julius Caesar was small, but the talk is that other invasions are planned. He certainly hopes not. He would rather be serving in newly annexed Egyptus at the other end of the empire. Only the generals and the officers in the big tent at the end of the row know what the long-term plans of the new emperor Augustus are. Lucius merely goes where he is told, and fights where he is told. He feels lucky to be a part of the great nation of Rome, a nation that controls practically the whole world, and will do so forever. 1,000 years ago. Empire after empire developed around the Mediterranean Sea and spread across Europe, Africa and Asia, clashing with the other empires found there. Then they collapsed, and usually the culture and technology generated with each empire collapsed with it. Ajolf Asvaldsson understands little of this. He is about to sail home, guided by the stone that seeks the North Star. He does realise, however, that places visited by long ships during the summer raids seem to have different histories and display different ruins. Almost everywhere in the world, shaven men teach the Christian faith and vehemently denounce the sacred names of Thor and Odin, and everywhere the people are adopting this faith, even some of Ajolf's own people. In this country, the Arab Kingdom of Spain, is a mixture of religions. Dark-skinned peoples who scorn the Christian religion have been settling here for a long time, alongside Christian people. They worship God in domed buildings, surrounded by spindly towers. What's more, they are gardeners and poets, and have a technical knowledge that is lacking elsewhere. Ajolf's abiding memory of the last raid is of a tower with sails. Ships, like his own, use the wind. They catch it in their sails and it drives them along. These people, however, use the wind to turn wheels and grind grain. 500 years ago. It is 69 days since they set out from Palos, and all that time they have been sailing westwards, except for a brief stop for provisioning in the Canary Islands, now they have arrived in India. Pablo Diego chides himself for mistrusting the captain. There was no way of telling whether or not the voyage was foolhardy. They just kept sailing westwards, totally the wrong direction for India, to the edge of the world, possibly to be admired by sticky seaweed or eaten by sea monsters. They could tell how far north or south they were by measuring the angles of the stars, but there was no way of telling how far west they had sailed. Several times he and the crew were on the verge of mutiny. They were wrong, however, and now here they are, safe beneath the palm trees on the warm beach, while offshore the three proud ships lie resting at anchor. It is the Indians that puzzle Pablo. Evidently, this is not the mainland of Asia, but one of the outlying islands, possibly the Japans. But where are the fabulous treasures, the gold and jewels that have been promised? Friendly or not, the gifts that the Indians bring are rubbish, beads and strangely coloured birds. Nevertheless, they do have gold rings in their noses, so there is wealth somewhere. If there is, why are the Indians not using it? They seem to have nothing, living in grass huts and growing strange plants for food. That does not worry Pablo. The captain has said that after a brief rest, they will sail around more of these islands. He can be sure that further to the west is the main continent, a civilised continent of civilised people who know what to do with their wealth. 100 years ago. The train rattles out from between the narrow paper houses, sending up thick clouds of black smoke that settles as soot on the ornate carvings of the caves, then coughs its way along the low embankment between the flooded fields of rice between the distant cotton mills. If there is anything that emphasises the changes that have come to Renzo Nariaki's beloved Nippon, it is this. He is an old man now, and he can still remember his place in the feudal society of the Tokugawa shogunate before it was overthrown. 
Then, with the civil war and the emplacement of the Emperor Meiji, the barbarians who had long been attempting to gain a foothold finally flooded in. They arrived at the request of the new emperor and changed everything. They were altering all aspects of society. At least he still had an emperor, but the government was now like that of a place called France. They still had a navy, but run along the lines of the British Navy. Their industry was being reorganised into the American style, while the army was no longer the army of the samurai, it was now like the army of Germany. The train has disappeared into the dark mills now, ready to pick up a heavy load. The traditional road transport could never have handled the volume of goods now being produced. It is probably like this all over the world, thinks Nariaki. The foreigners are imposing their way of life everywhere. Or perhaps we are absorbing the foreigners' way of life. Time will tell.